due to time constraint, we'll only take uh, one to two questions for each speaker. And for the speaker, kindly also answer, uh, try to answer them uh, short, precise, and clear. Uh, for Robert Schmidt, um, the first question was from YouTube. Okay, someone posted from YouTube. It's from Dr. Raymond Tan. If COVID-19 severity is a function of viral load upon infection, then cases will inherit features of previous cases. Can such an effect be integrated into an epidemic model? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I think that that in some sense it already has. Um, certainly, I would say when when I was designing the model, I drew on you know my experience with with other models like for HIV and so on, where yeah, infectivity generally scales with viral load, um, and so in that sense, I think it gives you the structure to design kind of you know the, the SAR type models and what type of transmission you're going to choose and so on. Um, but I think also there's probably room for quite a bit of expansion there that, that if the disease looks similar to other ones that we know, then we can kind of take some shortcuts in modeling. Um, so yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, another question, um, it's actually from me. Recently, there are uh, news reported, uh, new, uh, new COVID cases reported after being COVID free for weeks. So it seems that COVID like incubate or it appears that there is a, a delayed aspect of the activation of those who are exposed or um, after being exposed. So what, um, what do you think about it or can that be also reflected in the model? Yes, yes. I, I mean, I think one of the exciting things about a new disease in some ways is like it's such a free for all in terms of the models you design. Um, and so as more information comes in, you can you can keep layering. Um, this is very much something we did in the zombies. The zombies, of course, is just a you know fantasy disease, um, but it was really good for kind of letting you build up different things. And so functionally, you know, with, with models, what you're doing is you're making decisions all the time. And I think if you decide that this is significant enough, so you decide that, okay, yes, this, there is a delay in some people, if it's significant enough, you can put in another compartment or you could put in a delay. Um, you'd have to make a decision as to whether this is going to affect everybody or not. I mean, effectively, by putting in a compartment, you, you're building in a delay. So there's already a delay between immediate infection and then the symptoms. Um, that's through the exposed class. But you could put in further delays if you're going to say, well, yes, there is a, seems like there's a built-in delay for some people. So I'd say my instinct says put in a fraction of people who might have that delay if that fraction is found to be significant. Um, even if it's not found to be super significant, you could you could still investigate it. And that's, I think, the, the great thing about mathematical modeling. So you can say, well, let's see what the effect is. And possibly even just a very small number, you know, might have a huge effect, but it might not. Yeah, it's definitely something you could play with. Thanks, Robert. For Fred, um, there's two questions. First question is from Robert Schmidt. Okay, he asks, um, in the ternary plot, why do you start with deaths at 1.0? Shouldn't the number of deaths be zero initially? Okay, uh, let me just share my screen again so we can better illustrate the uh, this for this question. So, um, at each in each vertices of the ternary plot actually exist two numbers. Um, one is the 0, 0.0 and the other is 1.0. So for each um, vertices, the label indicates that the the uh, hundred percent of that uh, cases is uh, defined by the label. So in this case, you have the origin where the uh, the number of cases is or uh, uh, among the the ratio of the under treatment deaths and recovered is that there are hundred uh, percent active zero deaths and zero recovery so that's where the uh, the origin starts so there is uh, quite a confusion especially um, um in the ternary diagram about these numbers so uh, the the uh, the bottom line is the the vertex uh, uh, means that there is 100 percent of that uh, of that what is indicated in the label A second question from Dr. Kathleen Aviso. Is it possible to link the epidemic model with your ternary diagram? How do you think we can maximize the information within the two models? Um, well, the epidemic, um, well, um, for epidemic models, so we are more concerned about the rate, such as rate of 
uh, the infection rate of recoveries, rate of active cases. Now, uh, one of the limitations of the ternary diagram is that uh, these rates are not clearly visible in terms of it's it just present how the dots are being spread out through a trajectory. But if we are to just um, have the ternary diagram, the plots in the, or the the data in the ternary diagram expressed in two lines, then um, we have eliminated this uh, the rates instead. Um, unlike when we are using a scatter plot, so we can um, link the um, the information between the two models by their advantages being in a ternary diagram having um, uh, an indicator of the progress, while the epidemic models uh, are giving us the the rates or the uh, the rate as as to how the disease is spreading, how uh, the number of cases. Uh, recovered increases and the number of fatalities increases. Thank you, Fred. Um, let's move to Robert Neal. Um, my, I have a question. So my question is based on the forecast presented in your study, what is your suggestion or recommendation to our policymaker to improve our current situation? Uh, well, uh, one thing, ma'am, uh, we're not using. We are not yet so sure about the forecast. If you're looking, at, uh, if you're looking at, uh, if you're referring to the shaded regions, but what, ra uh, but rather, we are more sure about interpreting the estimates or the now casted values for RT. Now, um, as I have said in my parting slides, uh, what it actually suggests is that lockdowns has been effective. Uh, there's no question about that in in mitigating the spread it has not been successful in eliminating the in eliminating the infection but at least it has been helpful and given the current climate uh, what i would what we would suggest is that in the uh, in the absence of other things that they are currently doing because we are not entirely in the know of what have uh, is actually being done at the moment and it's hard to believe in news if you just rely on news so it's it's best if they really do have data on all these but if we are just going to base on the lockdowns itself uh themselves uh what we're suggesting is that uh they should not be deciding uh harshly on this but uh, harshly about um lifting premature lifting of these restrictions because to be honest we are still uh we would be much more inclined to continue the quarantine, at least only from an epidemiological perspective. Let me reiterate that. Uh, at least until we find sufficient evidence that the transmission, uh, the transmission is again reverted back to one, or at least RT is back to one, or transmission has been significantly reduced again. Okay, another question from Dr. Abiso. Uh, is it possible to identify the optimal time to lift lockdowns? Um, if it is only based on what we're doing the moment, the answer is no, because that is not uh, that is not what our tool or our estimation framework can do. But if uh, but if the question is for in general, I think a better model will be much uh, will be your mechanistic model, your SEIR model, which is like uh, what Dr. Smith has discussed. And I think that is where you can play out scenarios at least to identify when or uh, when best to lift lockdown or ease out the restrictions. But I think that is still, likewise, uh, as with any model, it is not absolute, but at least it gives you an idea on when to best do it but at the same time, put together all the measures that you have been trying to do to control these epidemic, or pandemic rather. Okay, uh, there are some more questions, but uh, due to time constraint, uh, we'll end the first half of the session and I'll pass the floor to Dr. Avisa for the second half of the parallel 